know, Pastor Doug and Krista are part of the lead pastor team. We do things a little differently around here, and we all serve together in a team environment as elders in the church. And it is, uh, last Tuesday was Pastor Krista's birthday. And we wanted to say happy birthday. Uh, Pastor Krista and I are roughly the same age. She's just a few months older than me. So every year I ask her when she turns that year, how does it feel? So Krista, how does it feel to be 35? It's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so glad. I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. Uh, but you know what I thought? It would be really fun just if we could sing happy birthday to Krista. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Krista. Happy birthday to you. Hey, can you just reach your hands out this way toward Krista? And we want to bless her. Lord, as a church together, as the church on the way, we bless Krista. We lift her up to you and thank you for this wonderful year. We ask that this year would be full of your spirit, full of joy, full of purpose, and that it would be the best year ever. Thank you for bringing her and Pastor Doug to the church on the way uh, to lead so well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, we get to go into a new series. Last, last week was Easter, it was awesome. How many of you are here for Easter? Yeah, it was so good, it was so good. Um, there were, uh, listen, I, I'm gonna tell you some numbers and it's not to flex, it's just to celebrate what the Lord did. Last week, uh, for over 10 services, starting on Thursday, going to Sunday night, we had nearly um, tw- uh, 30, sorry, I'm confused now, 3,400 into people, bodies here on the church. And that's a lot of people. Um, hundreds more online, but, but here's the best number of all. It's better than that number. We had 167 people make decisions to follow Jesus. That, that's something we're celebrating. And this series is designed to help those people and to help the rest of us understand what our identity in Christ is. Uh, it's called Real ID. How many of you know the California Real ID requirements uh, have come and gone, actually? Um, Originally, they were going to be May 3rd, 2023, and this whole sermon series was based on the fact that May 3rd, 2023 was going to be the day you had to get your Real ID, and then the state of California decided to put it off by two years. So now you have to get your Real ID by May 7th, 2025. (laughs) How many of you already have your Real ID? And you're all mad because you're like, why did I have to go stand in a long line to get this thing? How many of you have not yet gotten your real ID? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? (laughs) You're like, what are you talking? A real ID is, it's just a driver, it's like your driver's license, except your current driver's license and who knows when, but at some point there's going to be a law and a rule in the government that you can't travel anywhere, you can't get on a plane and unless you have a passport, but yeah, with, with right now you could go with your California ID with just a regular driver's license. You're going to need a real ID to get on a plane, to get into government buildings, to get onto military bases. Um, you're going to need this real ID. Just like now, you need your California driver's license. Many of us, maybe others of you have different kinds of IDs to do a whole lot of things, right? To get on planes. To do- I've been going to doctors lately with my neck and everything. And every time I have to give them my insurance card and my ID. Um, a couple of years ago, I was, tr- I was flying out of Burbank. Uh, by the way, if, if you don't know about Burbank Airport, that's the best kept secret in Los Angeles. <laughs> Go there, not LAX, if you can help it. Um, but I was running through security, TSA, and there was a little bit of a line, which there never is in Burbank, and I was a little flustered because my flight was soon, because when I go to Burbank, I get there about, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes before my flight leaves, (laughs) and uh, I'm like, shoot, it didn't work out this well, that well this time, and I took out my wallet, and I pulled my ID out, and I gave it to the TSA agent, and she just looked at it and shook her head and said, cute, and I thought she was just talking about me, you know, I was just saying, cute, but she said, you can't get through TSA with your Costco card. Uh, (laughs) So I reached into my wall and I pulled out my Disneyland passport and I gave it to her. (laughs) No, I, I, yeah, how embarrassing, right? But there's some things we can't do without having an understanding of what our identity is. And that's what this whole sermon series is going to be about, is learning our identity in Christ. 
Because just like a real ID is going to get us onto planes and get us into certain buildings and get us into certain situations, we are locked out of some situations unless we understand and grasp what our identity is in the Lord. There are some things, it's not that the Lord's locking them out, it's that we just can't access them until we fully understand who we are in Jesus. And so we're wanting this next few weeks to talk out of the book of Ephesians about who we are in Christ, about who God's made us to be, about what he calls us, not what the world calls us. And so we're going to be doing that together. If you're a brand new Christian, you can learn who the Lord's made you to be, or if you've been following the Lord for a long time, this is part of our year of foundations. So here's the good news. In Christ... Whatever identity I hold is secondary to my identity in him. So I have a Costco card in my wallet, right? That gets me into Costco. That's all it does. It, gets me, it doesn't get me anywhere else. It gets me into Costco so I can go eat free samples and I can go celebrate Christmas in July. That's all it does. Costco. But my identification, my California ID gets me into a whole lot of other things. You may be identified in certain ways, um, But that is not your true identity. That is not your core identity. That is not who you truly are. Galatians chapter 3. By the way, we'll be in Ephesians 1 if you want to turn in your Bibles there. But there's a couple of verses before then. Galatians um, chapter 3, verse 26. Paul's writing to this church in Galatia. And he says this. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ You have clothed yourselves with Christ, and now there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I want you to hear what Paul is saying. He isn't, I know it sounds like he's saying, hey, Jew and Gentile doesn't matter anymore, slave and free doesn't matter anymore, male and female doesn't matter anymore. That's not what he's saying. What he's seeing, he's talking to a people whose primary binary identification in their life were these three things. Are you Jew or Gentile? For a Jew in the first century, there were two kinds of people. There were Jewish people and there were Gentile people. There were no other kind of people. It was Jew or Gentile. If you lived in the first century, you were either slave or free. And you could celebrate your freedom if you were free. And if you were a slave, it was really hard to get your freedom. If you were in the first century, you were either male or female. These were the ways that people identify themselves. I am a Jewish free male. I am a Gentile slave female. That was their primary identity. And Paul comes along, inspired by the Holy Spirit, saying, those things are a part of your identity, but I'm telling you there's something deeper than that. You now get to live your Jewishness under the authority of Christ and what he's calling you to do. You now get to say, okay, I am a Jew, but I am a Christian first. I am a Gentile, but I don't live the way Gentiles live. Now I'm a Christian first. I am slave or I am free. By the way, later Paul would say, inspired by the spirit, if you were a slave and you could get your freedom, get it. The Bible does not condone slavery. And if anybody ever told you that, they're just wrong. Slavery is not something that was part of God's plan. But if you were a slave, Paul wasn't saying, well, if you get your freedom, then maybe you can be a Christian. No, right where you are, however you're identified, that's not your primary identification. Your primary identification is in Christ. Okay, that's really important for us to grasp. Now, we can say amen because we're talking about the first century, but let's talk about the 21st century. Our primary identification is not in our nationality. Oh, somebody's like, don't go there, Pastor Tim. Don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. Our primary identification is not in our nationality. Listen, I'm happy to be American. I'm happy that I, I have an American passport. I'm happy that I grew up in this country. Uh, there's a lot of blessings to go with that. But I want to tell you, my primary identification is as a child of God. And if you have a different passport or you came up from a different country, I have more in common with you than I don't have in common with you. Okay, so now it's really quiet. Now it's going to get even quieter. Our primary identification is not our political party. Yeah. (laughs) So that means I can be a card carrying Republican, but I have to take the principles of a Republican party and submit it under the lordship of Jesus. And where those things don't line up, I have to say it's Jesus first. I might be a card-carrying Democrat, and it's the same thing. It got quiet in here real quick. And it's the same thing. You unload, you line up your identity with Christ, and you say, if the party I belong to doesn't line up in certain areas, and by the way, neither party does. I'll just tell you that right now. 
you say, I'm going to ditch the things that are about the party because my party is not my identification primarily. My primary identification is with Jesus Christ. That's my primary identification. Our culture is very important. I'm not saying it isn't. Please hear me. But our primary identification is not our culture. Our primary identification is in Jesus. Right? The world tells us our primary identification. Okay, it's going to get real quiet now. But the world wants to tell us our primary identification is in who we're attracted to sexually what gender we're attracted to or what genders we're attracted to or even what gender we may identify with, I want to tell you today the good news of Jesus is that is not who you are identified as. You are identified as a child of God first. Regardless of whatever else is going on inside of us, our, our desires, our hopes, our dreams, our, we line it all up with the word of God. We line it all up with what Jesus says and we say, listen, this is how I feel, but I'm gonna believe what Jesus says I am, not just what I feel. Okay? And I'm not putting anybody down. Please hear me. If you feel like I'm judging you, I want you to understand that we're all in the same boat, right? We all have things that we've got to line up, whether it's political party, whether it's culture, whether it's nationality, whether it's orientation, whether it's attraction, we have to line up. If you are an alcoholic, you have an addiction to alcohol, you can't touch a drop of alcohol because you know that's going to take you right down the path of being a mess I want you to know that your primary identification is not an alcoholic. It is a child of God. You don't have to introduce yourself as an alcoholic. You say, hi, my name is Tim, and I'm a child of the living God. And I happen to struggle with something else, but my identity is not that. My identity is as a Christian, right? I, if you're me, then you're a guy who used to struggle deeply with lust and had that, that real quiet in here, okay. I am not the guy who identifies with a struggle with lust. I am the guy who identifies and says, I submit that desire and that struggle to the Lord every day. I'm crucified with Christ and no longer do I live, but Christ lives in me. And that's my identity. My identity is not in what I used to do. My identity is in who God did, what God did for me. That's my identity. And that's the, this, the message is good news. It's so, so good. Listen, listen to what, what God says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I'm going to need some water up here. I don't know. I'm preaching. I'm preaching. Next, I'm going to ask for a, a cloth to wipe off my sweat. I think Matthew can help me there. <laughs> Be flat. Yeah. <laughs> This is what the Bible says, and I want you to hear this, because some of this may feel sound offensive to you, and I'm not being offensive. I want everybody to understand, in this church, there's not fingers of judgment being pointed at things that we struggle with or things that we might be uh, dealing with. There, are not, there is a lot of grace. Grace is my favorite word, and it's God's favorite word. Um, but we also have to understand the truth, if we're going to get our true identity and walk in it. And here's the truth in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or 9 through 11. It says, neither the, sexual immor- the sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers or men who have sex with men or thieves or greedy or drunkards or slanderers or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to stop right there and tell you two things. First of all, I love it because in our culture, In Christian culture, just as much as the world's culture wants to identify us with our sexual sin, Christian culture does the same thing. And we point fingers at sexual sin more than we point fingers at any other sin. But I love that in the Bible, every time it talks about sexual immorality, just about every, not every single time, but very, 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 very often, it's part of a list of things that we're not ever allowed to point a finger at somebody else. We point a finger at ourselves. When you read that list, you got to read all of it. And you got to understand that sometimes we're thieves or we've been greedy or we've been drunkards or we've slandered others. Anybody ever slandered anybody in here? It's part of the list. And it says, these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what chance do any of us have? But it says, and that is what some of you were. Say that word with me. Were. You were identified with the things that you did, but now you are identified with what somebody else did for you. He died on the cross. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Listen, 
The world wants to and we want to identify ourselves with the things that we do. I did this thing, therefore I must be that. I stole something, therefore I must be a thief. I messed, cheated on my taxes, therefore I must be a cheat. I slandered somebody, therefore I must be a slanderer. I slept with somebody else, therefore I must be an adulterer. And we identify ourselves with what we did. And Jesus came and said, you're going to stop being identified with what you did. You're going to be identified with what I did for you on the cross. And here's the good news, because after we're identified with him, after we're washed, after we're sanctified, after we're justified, sometimes we still fall back into old patterns. Here is the news you need to hear. Just because you've fallen into an old pattern or an old sin doesn't mean you now are identified with that again. It means you did something that doesn't reflect who you are, and God's grace covers you. Every time you flip in and out, you don't, okay, now you're an adulterer. Now you're a slanderer. Now, no, you are not that thing. You are forever a child of God. And that's your identity. And that's my identity. Okay. Then we come to Jesus and we're transformed. He makes us into new people. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17 says, Behold, if anybody is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. It doesn't mean the old doesn't rise up every once in a while and try to attack and try to, try to become our identity again. But I want to tell you, the old is gone. Jesus has made you into something new. He has created you to be a child of God. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks is what our true identity is. Not the identity our heart tells us we are. Not the identity somebody else tells us we are. Not the the identity that the world says we are, the identity that God has created you for, and he says, this is who you are, and I want to tell you, I want to trust him more than I trust myself. I want to trust him more than I trust anybody else. So what do we have, and here's what we find in the first part of Ephesians, chapter one through seven, or chapter one, verse one through seven, we're going to read it together. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us to be in Christ in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Okay, is that awesome? You want to know something really cool? That is one sentence in Greek. It goes on and on and on. And by the way, the next seven verses are still part of the same sentence. It's like me talking and getting so fast with my conversation because I'm so excited. Paul is writing this down, led by the Holy Spirit, saying, I want to tell you about who you are. Four things we're going to talk about this morning. First of all, is that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Say that with me. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Does it say blessed with some spiritual blessings? Blessed with every spiritual blessing. Listen, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 says you lack no spiritual gift. There's not a gift that you lack. And after this series, we're going to have a series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Father, and the gifts of the Son. I can't wait for us to get a hold of that because when we start understanding how to function in our gifts, let me tell you, devil, you better watch out. Yeah. World, you better, I'm t- I tell them when we can function in our gifts, we start to become all that God has created us to be and he's gifted us for. But we've been gifted with every spiritual blessing. Second Peter 1 says that you have everything, say that word with me, everything you need for godliness. There's nothing God hasn't given you to be able to follow him fully. We have everything we need. And it says that we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, which isn't just blessings in heaven, but blessings from the permanent realm of the unseen. I grew up in a church culture that loved to think about heaven, that loved to think about the great by and by in the sky with a piece of apple pie. I can't rhyme anymore, okay. We'd sing, right? We'd sing, some bright morning when this world is through, I'll fly away, right? I don't know the rest of the words either, except I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. And you all said, Tim, keep your day job. Come on. <laughs> um, 
We talked about heaven in the future tense, in the when I die, it's all going to be good. That's when I'm going to be blessed. I'm living in this poor, horrible shadow world right now, but someday I'm going to die and there's going to be mansions and there's going to be gold and there's going to be streets of gold and all, you know, we get all excited about the future. And I want to let you know that it's exciting to think about heaven because heaven's going to be awesome, but we're not to wait till we die to get to heaven. We're supposed to allow God to give us heaven right now and we have access to heaven. We've been blessed with every, 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 every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And when it talks about the heavenlies, 2 Corinthians 4 says, we fix our eyes on not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary. Everything you see right now is going to be gone. But what is unseen in the unseen world, in the heavenly realms, not just heaven after we die, but the heavenly realm that exists all over us, that's eternal. That's the eternal realm where we get our resources and our blessing from. That eternal realm is giving us blessings, not when we die, but right now, every spiritual blessing is available to us in Christ through the unseen world that we live in that's more important and more temporary, more permanent than anything we see now. And so when I look at my life and go, man, I don't know, Lord, I need you to bless me. Lord, would you bless me? Don't we love praying that prayer? Lord, bless me. Let's stop praying, asking the Lord to bless us and start thanking him for the blessing he's already given us. Lord, you've already blessed me. You've already given me everything I need. You've already provided what I need. You've already blessed me in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing that I could possibly have. And we're going to talk about those blessings in the next few weeks. But first, I'm going to talk about three of them really quickly. First of all is this, that we are chosen before God made the world. Chosen. Say that with me. Chosen. Chosen before God made the world. God chose us. For some of you, you think, wow, that's really good news. I'm so glad I was chosen. For some of you, that's really bad news because you think, what if I wasn't chosen? If you're like me and when you were in fourth grade and they were choosing teams for kickball, and you were like one of the last chosen because you were uncoordinated and a little bit overweight. And the only reason you weren't chosen dead last is because they're like, well, he's big. He'll probably stop a ball somewhere just by his body, right? Or if you were in drama like I was and you tried out for the plays and every time then after the tryouts, there was a day that they would post, um, post the, they would post the cast list and everybody would gather around to look at who's on the cast list and who's not on the cast list. Um, we know what chosen is. And we know what not chosen is. Yeah. And so when we, see, when we read this, that we were chosen before God made the world, you think, well, if he chose some people around here, maybe he didn't choose me. But I want you to know that God chose every single one of us. Okay? At the very beginning, let's go back all the way to Adam and Eve. God makes Adam and Eve. He intends them to have a relationship with him forever in the garden. Uh, He intends them to have kids and grandkids and great-grandkids and all of humanity that's going to spring from Adam and Eve. His intention in that moment was that every one of Adam and Eve's children would be related to him, that they would have intimate relationship with God. He didn't create Adam and Eve and say, well, some of your kids are going to follow me and some of your kids aren't going to follow me. He said, as long as there's not sin in the world, I have chosen every single person. I chose you as individuals and I chose you as a human race before there was ever sin. But Adam and Eve sinned. Adam sinned. He brought death into the world. He brought rebellion against God. He turned away from God. And because he sinned, sin started infecting all of humanity. Every one of us has chosen sin, but we chose sin partly because we have a sin nature. Romans 5, 18 says, just as one man sinned and all of the humanity became unrighteous because of one man's sin, just the same way one man died for our sins and offered redemption to everybody, to everybody. We are all offered redemption because one man died. Now everybody can get in on this. In 2 Timothy 2, chapters 2, verse 3 and 4, it says that God wants all people, say that with me, all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God chose you before the world began. He had you individually in his eyes, in his heart. You were the apple of his eye. He chose you. But how many of you know it takes two to make a relationship? So God chose us even when we didn't do anything to deserve being chosen. That's grace. Even when I didn't do anything to to make God think, oh, that's, oh, Tim, let's bring him on. He'll be great for the team, right? No, I didn't deserve any of that, but he chose me then. Now I get to respond to that choosing. 
Now I get to say, Lord, do I want a relationship? Now sadly, some people will say, I don't want a relationship with God. And they're going to be out of relationship with God both here on earth and forever. But God has chosen each of us before the creation of the world. He loves you and he chose you specifically to be his son. He chose us to be holy and without fault in his eyes. The word holy, it says this, this whole scripture starts out with God, to God's holy people in Ephesus. And when you read that um, in some translation, it says to the saints in Ephesus. To the saints. Any of you not feel like a saint? Yeah? I got a, I got a leader in our, in our denomination who emails us and he starts out his emails with, um, dear saints. And while he's got a lot of great things to say, every time I read dear saints, I'm like, You're, who are you emailing? You're emailing the wrong guy. <laughs> I guess Pastor, Pastor Doug, maybe that's for Pastor Doug. He's the saint here. I don't feel like a saint. I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that the church is going to venerate after I die. And, oh, wow, look at what Pastor Tim did. Look at how amazing he was. You know, we should put a statue of him up. Yes, and you guys, that's not what the biblical version of saint is. The word saint sim- simply means holy and set apart for God's special uses. And he chooses you to use him for the things that he has created you for and for his special use. And he makes you blameless, which means that there's nothing the enemy can say to you. There's nothing your heart can say to you that's going to create enough blame for God to reject you. He has made you holy and blameless through his, son, his son's death. And because of that, I'm set apart. And I am without blame. And I keep pouring this water out. I'm just going to leave it down there. Okay, stop missing it. Um, so because I'm holy in my position, I also practice holiness in my lives, my life. I live out my identity. I live out my identity. Who am I? I'm a child of God. I've been blessed with every blessing in the heavenly realms. I've been chosen by the Lord, and now I'm going to live that identity out. I am going to say that's my identity, and that's how I live, and God's going to give me the power to do that. So I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, which includes being chosen before him, which includes being adopted into his own family. You have been adopted, and some translations, they're better, actually, at at the Greek on this one. You have been adopted as sons. I want all the women hearing me to say this, I'm a son. <laughs> Just say it, I'm a son, right? Listen, if I can be the bride of Christ, you can be a son, okay? <laughs> we, we all have to work, work with this a little bit, okay? But the reason it says as sons, it's really important because in Roman culture to which Paul is writing, the Holy Spirit's inspiring Paul to write, in a Roman culture, if you were a Roman uh, dignitary or you were royalty or you were somebody with a, an estate, the estate was, le- you couldn't write a will and be like, hey, um, I want to give my estate to Matthew when I die. I couldn't do that. I would legally be required to give it to my son. And if I didn't have a son, I would need to go out and find somebody, an adult, not a little kid, but an adult who I thought their character was good and I thought they could handle my estate and I would adopt that adult as a son. Sometimes Romans would adopt people that were even older than they were as sons so that that person could get their inheritance, okay? Now, you could disown your biological son, but you were not allowed to disown your adopted son. And Paul says you are adopted and chosen and adopted to his family as sons. You are a legal heir. You've been adopted into his family as a child of the king. If you are still having a hard time grasping this, there's a story, uh, a movie. It's a book. Most of us probably never read the book. Some of us may have seen the movie called Ben-Hur. You remember Ben-Hur? Some of you, Charlton Heston, right? Charlton Heston, this movie called Ben-Hur, it's about... Uh, a man named Judah Ben-Hur who was a Jew imprisoned on a Roman galley ship and he was a rower. And the ship gets into a battle, the ship sinks, he gets free, Judah escapes and he saves the life of the Roman commander Arius. And Arius' only son, we find out, has been killed. So Arius adopts Judah, who's an adult man, but he adopts him and Judah's pardoned under Arius' adoption for his supposed claims. By the way, when you're adopted into Roman, a Roman family, your old uh, debts, your old sins, your old uh, 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 problems with the law are all erased. And you're brought into a new family with a new inheritance. And Arius, young Arius, Judah's called now young Arius, and he has all the rights over the inheritance. And in the scene where the adoption is announced, Arius takes off his ancestral ring, and he gives it to the young Arius, the signet ring that, does, that, that signified his authority, his power, his resources, everything he is. And Arius, young Arius, says that he has received a new life, a new home, and a new father. And that's what happens when God has adopted us into his family. 
that we've received a new home, a new life, a new father, a new identity, new resources, something new. We're adopted into the family of God. Romans 8, 17 says we're not just children of the king, but we're co-heirs with Jesus, which means that everything Jesus had available to him as a human being, we have available to us right now as heirs of a father. We have everything we need, not just an inheritance in heaven, but resources on earth where God's kingdom rule is breaking through every day with the people of the kingdom, his rule and reign in us. And as we express that rule and reign in our world, his rule and reign, his power and his resource is all over the place because we who have been chosen, who have been blessed, who have been adopted. And then finally is this, that we are free and forgiven. (laughs) It says that Jesus purchased our freedom. Listen, church, adoption is costly. It costs a lot. Some of you have adopted kids and it costs a lot of money, but I'm telling you, adoption is costly. In the Roman world, it costs this, that you brought an adopted son in and that son had the full rights of your other children. It wasn't a little bit. It wasn't like, well, you're going to come in at half. No, you get everything that every other son got. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, paid the price for our adoption into God's family. He took the death that we had embraced and expressed, the death, by the way, that doesn't just kill us, but death that we we have in us impacts all of the people around us. We're not only, de- there's not only death in us, there's death through us. How many of you know that you, when you walk through life with death inside of you, the people around you have death too? Yeah. And Jesus came and took that from us and traded our death for his life. He redeemed us, right? Yeah. Have any of you ever redeemed a bottle? I don't know if we do that anymore. Redeemed a can? I used to go around when I was like 10 years old all over my neighborhood and pick up cans from people's trash cans. And at the end of the day, I had like, I don't know, a thousand cans. And I think you could trade it in for like 50 cents or something. And you had the added benefit that you smelled like stale beer, okay? Because you're collecting all these cans and trading them in. But Jesus traded his own life for our life. He turned in his death for the death that I'd embraced. And by the way, he was the only one that could do that because he'd never sinned. He'd never done anything to invite death. So he frees you from your bondages. He frees you from your addictions. He frees you from your um, places of, 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 of not being able to get free. He frees you in places where you feel like you're not able to. Yeah, you guys can go ahead and start. Yeah. Jessica? Yeah, you can go go ahead. Yeah. Um, That he frees you from the bondage of death. By the riches of his grace, you are free by the free, free gift of salvation. It's not just a gift that he gives you. He doesn't just give you, hand you a gift and say, here, take this gift. And now, oh, oh, we better keep it really careful because we might lose it. We might break it. Right? Have you ever gotten a gift that you're like, ah, I gotta be really careful with this because it's really valuable. So I'm gonna put it on a shelf. Salvation's not that kind of gift. The gift of salvation is a transformed life. It's bringing you from death to light. It's bringing you from bondage to freedom. It's bringing you from darkness to light. The gift of salvation is making you a new creation that identifies yourself with Jesus. That everything else the world tells you you are, everything else that the enemy tells you you are, everything else your heart tells you you are, you are not because you are a child of God. That is the freedom that we have in Jesus. And that's just the start of who we are in Christ. Let's bow our heads right now. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that we are yours, God, that we are identified with you when we come to you. And I recognize that there are many people in this room right now that may, number one, they know you, but they need freedom in you. They need fullness in you. They need, they need to find their identity in you. They might know you, but they don't know their identity and they need to know it. So right now, and if that's you, if you know you need to find your identity in the Lord, just act like you're receiving a gift. Put your hands out in front of you like you're receiving a gift. Lord, I pray that you would help people start to recognize the intense, awesome, amazing, eternal identity that you've given them. Now, as you're praying, I want everybody else to listen and keep your eyes closed. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never turned your heart to him, If you know your identity is something completely other than what God's called your identity to be, he would say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, all you who are burdened, all you who are abused, all you who are bound, and come to me to find freedom. Because I died on the cross so that you could find freedom and that I would give you a new name and a new identity in me that's worth living forever. 
If you don't know Jesus, or you've maybe said yes to the Lord, but you know you're not living in the reality of following Him with your whole heart, and today you would say, I am turning from everything else that I've been pursuing, and I'm turning to Jesus and letting Him make me brand new and give me a new identity. If you want that, would you just put your hand up and look up front? Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. Whatever room you're in, there's somebody up front agreeing with you. So not just in this room, but any room at all. Yeah, I agree with you. Who else? You'd say, that's me. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, both of you right there. I agree with you. Or both hands from one person. I love it. There you go right there. I agree with you and you and you. Yeah. Is there anybody else you're saying, that's me. I'm turning my heart to the Lord. I'm coming back to the Lord. I'm giving him everything right now. Is there anybody else? Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Lord, we worship you and we sing this song about our identity in you. Let's stand together and sing this song together. Let's do that. Hallelujah. I'm a child of God.
the Spirit of God in this moment. God is freeing some of you, setting some of you free, and I'm not going to get in the way. Jesus, do your work. God, set us free. Deliver us. If you are watching online, he is setting you free, and he is delivering you right in your living room right where you are God is doing a work in here he is reviving his people do you feel it I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm speaking to somebody do you feel it yes he is doing something in this place he's doing something in your heart and it's meaningful and it's internal it's eternal what he's doing in your life is eternal let him do his work let them change you. Let them set you free. Some of you didn't know that you were adopted. You didn't know that. You didn't understand it until this moment. But he has adopted you. And he has called you his own. Hmm. Lord, we give our lives to you. May you do a work in us, Jesus that we couldn't do ourselves. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. If you raised your hand when Pastor Tim gave that message and you lifted up your hands and you said, man, that's me. I, I, I need Jesus. I need the Lord in my life. I want to be adopted. You can text trust to 97,000 because let me tell you, to be adopted, that means you've been brought into a family. And when you do that, you can text the word trust to 97,000. You can fill a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. And what that is, what that's doing is you're letting us know that I want to be a part of this family. 
And we want to come alongside you as family. We want to come alongside you as a friend. And we want to say, look, let's walk this life together. Let's live for Jesus together. If you need prayer, we pray for healing earlier. If you're like, man, I still need somebody to pray for me. The prayer, the uh, wonderful prayer team will be outside and they are willing and they are available to continue to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, you can go out to the prayer tent and get some prayer. Amen? Amen. We have rooted groups starting up to be connected and join and get connected into this family. Rooted groups are awesome. They're amazing. They have been life-changing for so many people this season. So you can go outside to the tent and you can sign up to be a part of a rooted group. We got rooted groups starting next week. So it's a wonderful and wonderful opportunity today to get signed up for one. And you can start in a rooted group next week. We have groups meeting all throughout the week and that's for 10 weeks. But God is doing something. Baptisms is next week. Hallelujah. If you've never been baptized in water and you and maybe you've known the Lord for a long time, maybe you just came to know Jesus Christ and just got involved in the church, you can get baptized. If you've never been baptized in water, it is a wonderful, it is the symbol. We are called to do it. We have been commanded to do those things. Jesus did it, so I'm going to do it, right? Amen. Church, God loves you. Jesus has died for you to live a life of fullness in him. And we don't take that lightly. So I, I pray that his peace, his love, his guidance, his reassurance in your life will go with you today. And that you would go and you would leave this place with the blessing of God upon your life. May you feel it in the name of Jesus. We love you, church. Thank you so much for coming today. You are dismissed. Go and go forth and be a blessing to those around you. Amen.